Welcome, Gabriel. We are so thrilled to have you here Thank as you. another amazing guest on this show. People who are doing amazing, wonderful things in Portland. I appreciate that. How uh, how's your day going so far? It's going. It's actually a relaxing morning. Nice. To that, be honest, I, yeah. Did that, not. I did not like run out of the house this morning. I knew I was doing this, and so. Uh, my wife was nice enough to get my son to school, which is the early, he's good to go early, mm-hmm. and she left with two out of the three kids. I did the dishes, woke my daughter up. It was pajama day for her, so that made that made <laughs> nice. getting her dressed for school very easy. Nice, and oh, that's awesome. Then I uh, that. yeah, sounds like a good good start to the day. Yeah, get and I have a, I recently moved out of the city. Down, we moved in the end of summer. So in September, we moved down to Milwaukee. Okay. And I'm loving it. We got a half of an acre. Sweet we just got nice. a dog because we have a half of an acre. So we need to fill in that gap in our life, you know. Yeah, and you have, need more. Have someone to run around. You know, I, I can't get my kids to go outside and play as much as I want to. So we get a, you know, we got a puppy to go run around. Um, That's a good way to get them out there. But I actually, one of the like secret um, gifts that moving out of the city gave me that everyone probably would think would be a downside I love the commute it's like the right sized amount of commute it's about 20 or 25 minutes depending on traffic how do you do the commute what 199 vehicle? in a forerunner why do you like the commute excuse me because I like the, I like that gap between I have two lives I have the work life and then the, the dad husband life so like the, the chef life and then I've got like the dad husband life and having 20 minutes, 25 minutes. <laughs> That's all it takes to transition. When I am completely by myself, I can call people. I do a lot of like, I, you know, like obviously we're going to talk about recovery. I do a lot of stuff in AA. And like I call sponsees or sponsors. I Ooh. call, my, talk to my sponsor every day. And like being in the car, that's a great time. I love sports, sports talk radio. <laughs> um, I can also think about, get a lot of work stuff done before I like walk into the, wherever I'm doing. Um, you know, because with the newfangled stuff, you get the phones hooked up to the car, and so if you know, I get stuff done, or I just I, it's the, like to be honest, it's like sometimes it's the only twenty or twenty five minutes that I'm alone in a day. So your day is very full with many, many things that you're doing, and this is who the Gabriel Rucker is. So we're gonna we're gonna zoom out though, as we sort of dove right in. Sure. So we're gonna pull back a little bit. Sounds good. And Go back in the day. You grew up in Napa. Yes. Down in California. So I sort of, you know, this po- uh, podcast is about Portland Thank you. and people doing awesome things here. And so I want to hear about how you got to be in this place. So tell me sort of about childhood and growing up. And of course, you're this award winning, you know, two time award, James Beard Award, excuse me, winning chef. And with all this renown and all this stuff going on, so how did your childhood sort of lead into you know getting into food and and start sure. on that path as well? I grew up with you know well there's cool thing my parents are still together they're still married really so that's you know wonderful both my wife and my folks are still married which I think gives me a great chance to be stay married for you know. That's what I'm hoping for. But I grew up in a That's good, a cool simple family. Mom was a teacher, uh, elementary school teacher. Dad was a welder and a machinist. He worked as a civilian contractor, uh, first on a naval base, working on nuclear subs, and then at an Air Force base when the naval base closed, all in and around Napa, so Mare Island in Vallejo, and then Travis in Fairfield, <coughs> Travis Air Force Base. And I grew up just a pretty happy, normal, I was an only child. Um, my parents wanted to have more kids, but that didn't end up panning out. But I snuck out. <laughs> and um, Good thing. Just, yeah, just grew up in a, just like, you know, a lot of love, a lot of uh, good boundaries, good, solid, you know, childhood in Napa. Nothing, Napa's not that exciting, but it's also not that boring. People love to go there. Um, was you know, food a part of? I mean, no. obviously, you eat food. You had to sit. No. You had to, no. No. Wow, you had a foodless household. <laughs> yeah. No food. No, we weren't. Uh, 
you know, there's not like a... Was there a food focus? There's not like a trajectory of like, well, I get it, you know, like that's why you do what you do. Clear thread, right? Um, I mean, being in, in Napa, obviously there's amazing restaurants there. And so, like, it's subconsciously around you. Like, I knew what Bistro Don Giovanni was. I knew what uh, Trevigne was. Um, but we weren't, like, I didn't grow up with, like, a food culture. My dad entered into recovery when I was nine, so he didn't really drink. My mom would, like, give or take every once in a while. There was, like, a Sierra Nevada or, like, a bottle of Chardonnay that would be open in my fridge forever. So there wasn't, like, a big wine, you know. Um and I ate a lot growing up. Like I ate like um, frozen TV dinners. You know, we, I think Budget Gourmet was the brand that was in the freezer a lot. I liked the beef stroganoff. I was partial to that. That doesn't mean that my parents didn't like cook or feed me well. But like it wasn't just like it wasn't like there wasn't like a, they weren't foodies. There was no, we weren't foodies, and it wasn't like like a culture of like oh I get it I can connect the dots to where I am today. Um, I did have my dad's parents, when they would come to town, we would go out to lunch in Napa. They were big martini drinkers, so we would go out somewhere where they could get some martinis. So as a kid, I might have gone to a couple of nicer restaurants than maybe I grew up in, like, you know, Detroit or something. I don't know. Yep. But, I mean, I remember, like, like Trevigne was, like a, was a nice restaurant that... Um, in St. Helena. I had calamari there. It sounds like it was an Italian restaurant. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, that was it. You know, I one of my chores, um, when I started having, like, a list of chores that I had to do, was to make, uh, make dinner one night a week. I think I might have given that yeah. to myself, though. And we did have an old, uh, like, 1970s California wine country cookbook that I dug out. And it did have one recipe for like making spaghetti sauce from scratch. I think that's the only dish I ever remember actually making when I was supposed to make dinner. But I also was like a latchkey kid, so I'd come home, my, both my parents worked, so I'd get out of school, take the bus home, and like make myself food. And like I remember some of my favorite dishes were, and still to this day, um, tortilla chips with cheddar cheese put in the microwave. If, <laughs> when's oh, the last time you stuff. had that that's right good, that's yeah. really good um but i remember like making i don't know if you can cuss but a really fucked up tuna salad oh you're good <laughs> with like some weird shit in it that was like that was the experimental phase but uh what was in it i can't remember but weird ch- I mean, large really large chunks of carrots that's what i remember <laughs> and way too much pickles ah. um but uh yeah that's it so think about two things that are in your life now, fitness and, and athleticism and all this, as well as you've referenced a couple times sobriety and recovery. Yeah. So you said that your dad went into recovery when you were nine. Yeah. So what sort of a, what sort of awareness of, of drinking and alcoholism or recovery did sure. you have at that point? Tons. I mean, I remember like... In, you know, like, your childhood, right? Like, there's so much stuff that you don't remember, and I am so thankful for that as a parent now that there's so much stuff my kids aren't going to remember. <laughs> but there's, like, moments, right, that are, like, boom, the clearest. And uh, my father took me, I was nine, and he took me on a drive. We went up, we, you know, from, from Napa up to Calistoga, which is up in the valley. And Calistoga was a little bit funkier back then in, you know, 1990. And we were going to kind of soak in the hot spring pools up there. Something we would do to bond, you know, go at nighttime and hang out in the natural warm springs. And I remember him, you know, that was like, obviously, I'm I'm sure he had been working up to telling his nine-year-old son this. Um, But anyways, I remember like in his gray Nissan truck, him telling me that he was in N.A., not A.A., and that he was, you know, had used drugs and he was gonna, gonna make changes. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't wrap my head around it because up until that point, the only people that I had a vision of that used drugs 
were as a kid driving through the Tenderloin in San Francisco with like prostitutes and like kind of like 80s punks with you know like the kind of guys that try and like stick up Indian Indian or um, Crocodile Dundee you know that's not a knife this is a knife that 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 was my vision as a nine year old kid of what someone that used drugs was like, and so having my father tell me that was like, it was crazy, because um, obviously you loved your father. Yeah, and, and I didn't know. Scheme. You know, I was nine. I didn't like. You know, looking back now, I could see some signs, but I didn't know. But the cool thing that happened was one is that like, my dad's a super cool dude, and so is my mom, and they stayed together. He got sober. She dealt with him getting sober. Um, he had the balls to tell his nine-year-old son. And what that did for me is it made that, that just a normal part of my life. Um, what? Oh, just the fact there was recovery openness. and communication, you know, right? There was, and, uh, and I knew, fuck, five, six years before I ended up getting sober. I knew that there was A... A successful way out and be that that I just needed to get my act together but that I could and I did like I knew there was a path to it it wasn't like this foreign mountain that I couldn't climb it was like there for me when I was ready and I tried once or twice kind of like very not even like half-heartedly like one-eighth heartedly <laughs> you know I like had a bad night drink I was like oh and I like went to an AA meeting once and then, like, I'll just drink some wine, you know. But when I was ready, I knew that it was there. It was a good example. That was like the, one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me. Yeah, that is that's a major. Watching it work, th- you know. Watch it, you know. I'm like, I remember as a kid, getting up, and my parents are around, you know, having coffee in the morning, reading like daily reflections and serenity prayer and stuff like that. So there was a religious aspect. No. No, but a pro- oh, that's like oh, sorry, it, not twelve step with that. stuff. Yeah, okay, but so twelve step stuff does have that, yeah, Spir- somewhat spirituality. There's a lot of spirituality. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah, not a lot of religious stuff. But I thought all. AA does mention God, right? Sure, yeah, but that God slash higher yeah, power. Yeah, I mean, do you, I mean, that's a whole other topic. But that's, that's a tough one, man. Like, I mean, do you consider a God to be a strictly religious thing, or is like? Like, right, you climb mountains, you ever, like, climb a mountain and feel close to something that you're, like, aware of, but not aware of, and, like... Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, yes, I... Going into nature is deeply spiritual. And so that's... that's so spirituality versus religion, that's... Like, yeah. It's that somewhat semantical, but... Mmm. Somewhat not. <laughs> I would say if you asked me... I would tell you that I'm a very spiritual person and I'm not very religious. Yeah. My family does go to church occasionally, though. For community. Going back to what I mentioned before, before, uh, before getting on the topic of your father and, and recovery, is now fitness is a huge part of your life. Huge. And so... Was that a part of your life back then in childhood? Were you athletic? Were you, did you play sports? Yeah. Was there an yeah. example there? Not like, uh, yeah, I was always doing something. I was uh, soccer and baseball. Basketball was like number three. I liked it. I liked playing basketball more like with my friends, like just playing games than on like the fo- format of like the team and stuff. Soccer I had a blast at. Baseball, loved. Still to this day, my favorite sport. I'm a huge sports person. Watching. Yes. Who's your team? Baseball? Yeah. San Francisco Giants all the way. Mm-hmm. Die hard. Uh, and um, also, um, as a kid, going back to my dad, I'm not trying to make this a dad podcast, but in the, um, you know, like 70s, 80s, California, he was, you know, mountain biking early on you know Gary Ritchie and early on specialized and um, also him and his friends were like you know he's a welder so they were my, my first bike was made by my dad like wow um, and uh, he's really into roller skating 
like but on the skate parks no uh, so him and his friends which was kind of had like a burning man crowd esque uh, vibe to them but him and his friends would go and take their you know four wheeled roller skates to all the skate parks and skate vert and stuff and so then I rollerblades came became cool and so I got rollerblades and so we would wake up super early in the morning and they would go like these like you know 40, 45 year old dudes and roller skate and I would rollerblade in the skate parks before all the skaters got there. I'm sort of blown away. That's amazing. And snowboarding too. We, you know, up in, uh, in Tahoe early on before you could really get a lift ticket with a snowboard. It was You were like cutting edge sort of. I wasn't, but I was sports. just like tagging along. I was when we you know felt fun so yeah there's a major major athletic element to all those things you're yes. really getting after it cool yeah so then what led to one your eventual struggle with substances and two this whole path of to becoming a chef mm, I think they go hand in hand the, le- the, the well yeah I think I had the 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 drug and alcohol thing just kind of it was just there. It was, you know. Were you partying in high school? Fuck or? yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was the kid like in middle school, you know, I saw like someone had weed and I was like, I want to try that. How do I find that? <laughs> you know, like, who? that sounds, I want to see what that's like. You know, I was the, always the one that was like, you know. You're an explorer. Got busted, you know, freshman year of high school, putting to keep all the tequila down my pants, walking out of Safeway, just... Do, yeah, I was, I was always a good kid, but I just wanted to get high. Um, so that I think it just had that ingrained in me. Um, what led to cooking was, oh, I got graduated high school and didn't know what I wanted to do. I got fine grades. I didn't get great grades. Uh, if I would have applied myself, I probably would have gotten better grades. But I was into smoking weed and raving and raving. Oh, nice. big time, man. So that was sort of probably when raving was just raving was radical. Ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine. Big 99. warehouse scene. Illegal raves in mm-hmm. Oakland. Second and Jackson. That was Second and Jackson was a big one. Home base right Home behind. Base, yeah. yeah. Um. And uh, so, anyways, I graduated high school, and uh, it, my 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 folks were like, "You're not just gonna live at our house, so you can." Because you didn't have college plans at that point. No. They were like, you can get a job and pay rent if that's what you want to do. Or you can go to college and we'll help you succeed. Um, and so I decided to go to Santa Rosa Junior College, which is like a 45 minutes to an hour in Sonoma, away from Napa. Uh, that way I was, you know, it wasn't too big of a leap for me, but I was still moving out of the house, moving away, a different city. And uh, I, uh, on my first day at junior college had a I think it was a pre-algebra class Mm -hmm. that involved a lot of labs labs was a foreign concept to me at that point and it's still a foreign concept to me because when the lab was described to me I walked out of the class and went to the counselor's office and said I don't think that this is for me because the lab thing doesn't sound good and the counselor was nice enough and honest enough with me to tell me that maybe a vocational program was more up my alley and hand me a piece of paper with a list of vocational programs and uh, I had worked in high school serving people food at a bagel shop and so I pointed my finger at the cooking one and the next day I went to a cooking class at San Rosa Junior College with an amazing teacher who's still there Chef Michael and it was a two-year class um, I told my folks that I was going to become a chef. They seemed elated. I think that at that point, like, they were like, what the fuck is he going to do? Oh, my God. And I was like, I'm going to do this career. And they were like, amazing, you know. <laughs> they, so right he's away, got a path. You, you felt... And so I was like, it was like, class, you felt something. Versus, like, versus like being like, hey, I'm not going to do traditional school. And they were like, well, you need to get, you know, a master's. They were like, amazing, great. That's fantastic. And I, like I said, I think just at that point, any path would have been great. And then I went to the class and it was like, it felt good. 
the analogy I use is like I if you give me a pen and a paper and I'm sitting in front of a field and there's a horse and you say draw the horse the horse that I draw is gonna look the exact same as the horse that my seven-year-old child will draw okay I cannot put an image with my eyes onto paper with a pen but food made sense to me like they started explaining it I started you know like one of the things that I think gives me a good leg up or, is I can kind of taste in my head without tasting with my mouth and so food kind of like the build like the gears all lined up when I start, started looking at food working with it I was excited about it um, I couldn't wait to go to school I dove in head first which for an 18 year old kid that's great find something you're, I didn't have anything I was passionate about except for spinning trance records smoking weed you know so to find something I was passionate about that I was also getting like being told good job by my parents I was pleasing them and I could make a paycheck it was amazing Boom. so of course I dropped out of school because <laughs> I wanted to work man okay. I wanted to like I didn't want you know I did a year but like the second year just seemed like I moved back to Napa and I got a job. I wanted to work. I wanted to do it. I didn't want to like learn about what it was. You know, the teacher would always be like, "When I was working in San, you know, everything was like when you're work when you're actually working in the kitchen." And I was like, "Fuck that! I want I want to do it." So you're an experience based. Sure, that's what you wanted. Sure. Yeah. So I landed a job at the Silverado Country Club, which is like this fancy hoity-toity country club, uh, which ironically enough is literally like a mile and a half as the crow flies from the house I grew up in. I did not move back in with my parents. And still to this day, 18 years old, I moved out. I've never moved back into my house. Never thought about that, but I think a lot of people do. And uh, so I got a job at this country club, and I was this like real lanky, probably like buck 30 soaking wet kid wearing these like insanely starched chef checkered pants and outfits, you know? I bought a fresh pair of Doc Martens that were gigantic and shiny to cook in. And I like was just this total little nerd, you know. Did you have tattoos already? No, no. Um, and uh, I, uh, I just asked a lot of fucking questions. And I was like, that I, I don't know. I was really lucky because some, something clicked that people took me under their wing. And they weren't like... I wasn't. I, I was maybe the right amount of annoying. I don't know, but I wanted. You were I wanted, persistent. You I were wanted asking. in on everything, you yeah. know, and I think that at a country club, a lot of times, is people have been like, it's a place that there's not a lot of enthusiasm. It's a place people maybe go to work when they've kind of are just there for the paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so I was this kid, and um, and I was so enthusiastic and I wanted to know so much and like everybody was so cool and it was like how do you do this how do you do that how do you? and it was like we're gonna come here we're gonna show you how to do this I'm gonna show you how to do that and I worked there and I got a ton out of it and I loved it um so it was the first big experience yeah so how'd you get to Portland from there well I moved to Santa Cruz I had an opportunity to move to Santa Cruz California which I think a the age of 19 to maybe 20 why wouldn't you move to Santa Cruz California appealing, when presented yes. with the opportunity and so uh, my friends my girlfriend at the time we moved into a, a, a condo that was owned by a friend's mom in Aptos which is just a little south of Santa Cruz mm -hmm. and I was supposed to because I had, was working at the country club the chef there had an inn Pebble Beach you've heard of it right I was like I I'm going to work at Pebble Beach I'm going to commute down to Pebble Beach. This is going to be great. It's going to be amazing for my career. They drug test. I'm going to stop smoking weed so I can get this job. And uh, I did that. I didn't smoke weed for like over a month. Drove down to Pebble Beach and I was like, hey, I'm here to see Chef. I got referred by Chef Pock at Silverado Country Club and they were like, oh, that chef doesn't work anymore. We don't know. Who are you? <laughs> Here's an application. <laughs> and I filled it out and I was like, Fuck. I think I might have gone home and smoked a bowl. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, all things happen for a reason. I never got the job at Pebble Beach. But I did knock on a door of a restaurant right down the street called the Southern Exposure Bistro. 
and uh, got a job there in a very un-uniform kitchen that was very free for all. And this young kid who's cooked professionally for like a year, mm-hmm. gone to school to cook for a year, and I'm like in charge of putting plates and dishes on the menu. The chef is a raging alcoholic. Uh, the other guy who's the cooking, existing chef was was yes the other guy that was cooking there uh, is named Dave Reamer turns out he's now my best friend amazing photographer yeah. he is the photographer that shot the La Pigeon cookbook he's also uh, one of the gentlemen that I moved to Portland with because after two years in Santa Cruz we couldn't afford to go to San Francisco so and he was the raging alcoholic chef no 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 he was oh. the line cook he was the other yeah, guy that worked there cook. yeah and uh, so, yeah, so anyways, we're at Santa Cruz for two years and uh, cooking, learning tons, teaching myself tons, falling asleep every night thinking about what I want to cook the next day, partying. I mean, my house had a swimming pool and a pool table in the basement, you know, so we would go back and eat frozen corn dogs and drink Jim Beam, and it was just such a good life. It was such a good life. Uh, but, you know, with two years in Santa Cruz and we, were, we wanted more. San Francisco was unobtainably expensive then. And uh, and uh, this guy Dave Reamer, who was I was cooking with at that restaurant, um, he had a friend come through, who was like, "Portland's a cool place, dude," and that was like all it took, was that statement. Portland's a cool place, dude. What year was that? Two thousand one or two. I think two thousand two is when I moved here. So we like drove. To Portland. So you didn't have a job lined up? Nothing. Just, no, we drove to Portland cool. one weekend. And we were here for two days and we scored a house, a big four bedroom house on the corner of 39th and Powell. The rent was 1400 bucks a month. And uh, we like just got that house in like a day or two. Like using classifieds ads and Craigslist at the, maybe it was Craigslist at the library. There was no iPhones. And then drove back down and got a U-Haul. And the next week, we were moving to Portland. We pulled into Portland with our U-Haul. We pulled on to Hawthorne, right off of Hawthorne Boulevard, because someone said Hawthorne was like the Telegraph Avenue of Portland. It was June. Parked the U-Haul, and there was some like dudes strumming a guitar with a case of paps on their porch. And they were like, do you guys just move here? And we were like, yeah. And they're like, welcome to Portland, bros. And that was like literally <laughs> my getting out of the car, being an official Portland resident experience. Perfect. And right, like, Perfect. couldn't be any better. And so, I oh, remember wow. it. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. I love these clear memories. Of course. So you're here in this crazy place. What was your first impression of the town? Actually, like um, being in in it. it. I mean, it was fun. It was nice because it was the furthest. It still is the furthest I've ever lived away from home. Um, so it was like, I was finally out of that, like, two-hour car ride from, you know, so I felt like, okay. And it was a city, um, which felt good. It was a step up, right? Like, I wasn't like... Because you'd never lived in a city at this point. No. Yeah. I mean, we'd go spend time in San Francisco and Oakland and stuff, but never lived in a city. Because Santa Cruz is... Santa Cruz is so, town, no, right? so funky and small, yeah. Um, and so it was cool to be in a city... I, um, we, none of us had any money. We smoked tons of cigarettes and drank tons of coffee, but we didn't have any money. So like I used all my money and I would go buy a a big thing of top rolling tobacco and a big thing of Folgers. And at that time I was, uh, the guy, David, one of the guys who I moved here with, the other guy I moved here with was named Jake. He's a high school best friend. Uh, but so David was a guitar player. I thought it'd be cool to be a guitar player. I play guitar about as good as I draw horses. <laughs> but it's a great thing to do to pass the time when you don't have a job and you don't have any money and you have a killer porch to sit on on 39th Avenue and it's June. Absolutely. And you have a can of Folgers and a can of Top Rolling Tobacco. And so I, my mornings would be... Sort drink- of an Elliot Smith type. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Elliot Smith without the talent. <laughs> But, you know, that was my mornings, was just drinking shitty coffee, smoking shitty cigarettes, and trying to play pavement. Um, pavement and uh, Mermaid Avenue, the will, uh, oh, right? That album is yeah. incredible. I almost got down one of the songs, oh too. Anyways, we would I would do that, and then, uh, like, job search for, uh, briefly, and then we would um, 
pitch in our dough and get a frozen lasagna, a big thing of French bread, and like a gigantic magnum of Vandage, like um, red wine, and or two, Little and that would be our nights. Yeah. And then I got a job, uh, briefly, in a kitchen uh, that like was good, but it, it wasn't like pushing me where I wanted to be. And I was lucky enough to end up like within two or th- two months or so at Paley's place, which was like the creme de la creme. Still the hardest kitchen I've ever worked in. So you just lucked out getting in there? Or? Met the right people. I mean, I literally knocked on the door to apply, and the chef, Vito, was there. Gave him my resume. I think they needed somebody. I went in for, you know, for those of you that don't cook, what's called a stage, a tryout. Uh, I lied about my experience. I mean, my, it was on my resume, but, like, I definitely, like, you know, fake it till you make it, of course, okay? Of course, But, uh... They gave me a job, and I was in over my head, but, like, I think that there's a certain amount of, like, if you want to move forward in life, you've always got to find a way to be slightly in over your head, or else, if you're not challenged, right, you're always going to, like, don't play it safe. Yeah. So I was, did that for two years and just, like, was crushed and loved it and made some great connections, and uh, it was a very fond, I, all of my, all of my memories of kitchens are just really fond, and, uh. All through this period, this whole progression from Santa Cruz coming to Portland, you know, drink, smoking the, the cheap cigs and, and drinking the Folgers, I'm assuming fitness was not a big part of your life. Fitness was not a part of my life. That's correct. Okay, okay. Not at all. You could not at all. S- you could say, I mean, before when fitness was a part of, like, sports were, activities were a part of my life, that's what you do as a kid, you're right? You're yeah. not like, oh, I'm... Like, I don't think kids don't refer to it as fitness, right? No, yes, yes. It's only when we become old and, like, the waistline starts to want to creep that we're it's like, true. well, I'm doing fitness. Then, as excuse a kid, me, excuse you're me. just, I meant, you're just so when you doing were, shit when, when you were, you were going kid. snowboarding yeah. and doing these things. Yeah. You just stopped doing that. You weren't... I did. I went up to Mount Hood, like, a, just a few times. When so I, you, had, you brought a snowboard up to Portland? I did. I don't have it anymore. So there was still some for some time of ref- for in, time of reference. Fitness. I remember driving up to Mount Hood to snowboard one of the few times I did, and the Modest Mouse song "Float On" I think had just hit the radio, so it played about fourteen times on the drive from Portland to Mount Hood. It's good to go. Yeah, that was you know it was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the the restaurants you're famous for now. The Pigeon, Little Bird, and Canard. Sort of uh, this epic trifecta that you are heavily lauded. Tell us about that process, getting getting it started. Which What came first, of course. Sure. How that sure. So going. I was uh, out of work. I had, I'm not going to, we don't have time to go into the whole, my whole, you know. Anyways, I had taken a job as a sous chef at a restaurant. Uh, at the age of 24 after Paley's it's called the Gotham Tavern it was a big deal and it imploded after a year April 29th my birthday is when we found out the restaurant was closing um, and I was out of work um, and I was I was actually like um, kind of like part time slinging pizza at Nostrana but that wasn't like a long term fit for me and I got put in contact with the owner of a restaurant that was on its way out, kind of, not doing well. Um, it, was, it was called Colleen's, and it was on on the corner of 8th and East Burnside. The, uh, a, a gentleman named Charlie, who uh, I had worked with, put me in contact with the owner. And uh, he met with me, and they weren't doing so hot, and he was looking for someone to make a change. I think it was only like six months old or something. And, you know, I'm like this 25-year-old kid that he's never even had my cooking. And he's like, well, let's give it a shot. We got we got about three months to turn this thing around. That's a common misconception that we can actually, you know, clear the air. Mm-hmm. I didn't like, at the age of 25, I wasn't like, I want to open my own restaurant. I'm going to make a business plan. I'm going to get some money. I'm going to get funded. And I'm going to open a restaurant. I just was a kid that was given three months with an existing business that wasn't doing well 
to turn it around. Luckily enough, when I did turn it around and get it going well, I was able to buy in and become a business owner. Okay. And it was the same name? It was Colleen's. Oh, sorry. It was Colleen's. At what point did the name change? Well, Colleen was out. Okay. And so we couldn't call it Colleen's. I already had the tattoo on my arm that said Le Pigeon with the pigeons. And we couldn't come up with a name for the restaurant. And my buddy, Tommy Habits, now the owner of Pizza Jerk, Bunk Sandwiches, and a wonderful human being, was hanging out in the kitchen because he was between jobs. He was hanging out just to hang out. And he was, I think he was like cutting a salmon. And he looked down at my arm and he said, you got a good name for a restaurant tattooed on your arm. Cool. And it clicked. Naming restaurants is a lot like naming kids. Like you talk, you spit a, spitball a bunch of shit around, right? Talk a lot of names. And when the one that's supposed to happen happens, you, feel you like know it. And it's like, okay, good. And that's how all of my kids have been named. And like the restaurants, like, you know, it's like everyone's spitballing names. And when it's the right one, everyone kind of looks and there's like, yeah, that's it. So what's the backstory of why the birds on the arm? Uh, this was the second tattoo I got, and uh, second ever of your now many. Yeah, 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 yeah. The first of the like kind of kitcheny food related ones, um, pigeon. You know the French like we love cooking the pigeon, but also if you're the pigeon in French slang, you're kind of like you do the dirty, the dirty work. Like you're the one that like has to, you know. Scrub the oysters or mop, you know, plunge the toilet or whatever. So, but there's pride there, right? Like I, you're doing the dirty work. Well, I mean, done. the irony is, yeah, the irony is that as you own and operate more restaurants, you end up having to do more of the dirty work. I, I always, I, I like, like, I love. Uh, we have um, our garbage cans are out on the, the street in the corner of Eighth on Burnside for Canard and Le Pigeon, and um, I always say that you know when I walk into work or that. Cleaning up that those garbage cans and making those dumpsters neat is like it's the chop wood carry water of the restaurant owner, it and is. I relish that task because to me, if I have a clean garbage area and you walk into one of my restaurants, then you won't ever notice it. That's a good thing. But if it's really dirty, you will notice it. So you're the pigeon. When I can be, I think yeah. And so then you played off the bird theme in the next restaurants, correct? Yeah, we had Pigeon was going really well, and I think I was it was four years in, and we decided to open up a second restaurant, Little Bird. I was too too young to do that. You feel it came before you were ready? Or? Yeah. I was also, like, circling back. I was, like, not in a good place with how I was handling stress and using alcohol. I had also had my first child. No, 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 no. We opened the restaurant, and then six months later, we had my first child. So you could say there was a lot of heavy stuff happening. I wasn't handling it well. I also was dealing with a lot of, like, fame, and not fame, but recognition. And, you know, at a, at a young age, handling that. I'd like you got to an s- award for being the, the best, best young chef. The best, that was one yeah. of the James Beard awards, yeah. correct? And I'd like, you know, I don't let that stuff go to my head, but, like, it's still, like... It's a big deal. Like... It didn't make me, like, egotistical or, like, think that my shit didn't stink, but it also means that the pressure is, like, way raised when people come, you know, are flying from New York to eat at your restaurant and, like, I just want to cook good food and I have fun doing it, you know? And, like... How are you handling the stress with alcohol and... Yeah, for sure. That was the num. That was your go-to? Yeah. Drug of choice? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, so we opened Little Bird. We moved um, the my, like my number two guy at La Pigeon over to be the chef over there. Um, I, you know, he did he did a great job, cooked great food, but I didn't. You know, at that point in my life, I wasn't like good at setting boundaries with impl- like people and like. So I kind of let him do what he wanted, and then, you know, I, I that would be a regret. You know, not not knowing how to be assertive. It's tough. I was always the youngest. I was the owner and the chef getting all the accolades, but I was always the youngest one, too. So, like, that's a strange dynamic, right? Like, I'm the kid, essentially, and all, like, these people... It's shifted now, thank God. Now, you know... 
Now I'm the old man. Did it feel like it gave you some license to... I mean, of course, you were running the I show. I took a license to... Is that yeah. why your food was so... Known to be so sort of daring and outrageous is like I mean we were just you could do what you wanted to do, but we were just I mean, we weren't trying to do anything that was uh, crazy. We were just wanted to make food that we wanted to eat. Sure, we were pushing it, but not like for like stupid, re- you know, not like. No, not it's like you. You're like I want to eat foie gras pancakes with yeah. some crazy shit. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like you're having fun with it. And then like you know, and then like. It kind of just builds on itself, and it's like, oh, you've got a shtick that people are liking, and this is, you know, I still do to this day feel like, you know, like the food that's created at La Pigeon, or maybe just in general, like it's hard to be original, you know. But I think like that the style of cooking that we do, and I say we because now there's a lot of people that have their hands in the creative process. I kind of set the tone, but a lot of people play all the different instruments. Um, but I think it's it's original. I think it has its own voice. You can never do something that nobody has done before. That's a stupid thing to try and beat, you know. Somebody else has smoked foie gras and put it on a pancake. That's fine. But, like, what, just, like, you know, I'm not stealing that idea. I'm just sure some guy in Spain or something has done it. But, but you're adding your own. But we're just, but I feel like there's, like, a real original voice that's, uh, that's happening. So there's a lot of topics to cover here, and we don't have... All the time in the world. I'm fine. We can go a couple minutes longer. Cool, cool. You can edit all this stuff out that you don't like. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to chop most of this out. <laughs> Not Just kidding. This is gold, baby. So what I want to really hear about is the sort of breaking point of, I don't need any necessarily gruesome details, but when you really decided to make the change of becoming sober and then how that has led into this current fitness Activity recreation yeah. boom that is in your life that is inspiring many people. We should also note that. That's good. I like that's exciting. Um, so I was I looked in the mirror one day or something like that. I don't know, and I was just not healthy. This is before I got sober, and I wanted to do something about it. So I kind of I, I did. I started going to the gym, but I was still like getting fucked up every night. Like there was nights where I'm like. I would like eat pain pills and drink whiskey and then wake up and go and work out and like you're just not gonna that's like sure I'm moving things at the gym but I'm not getting you know yeah. any sort of results and uh, so you know life came to a head like I said before earlier in our podcast I knew that there was a way out I just had to be willing to take the plunge and, uh, you know, some shit had gone down. My family was eating at Little Bird for lunch. I was incredibly hungover and embarrassed about some stuff that had happened the night before. <coughs> and I asked my dad to take me to a, if he would take me to an AA meeting because I wanted to be done. And he was nice enough to do that for me, with me. Is he still an AA or does he follow that path? NA. NA, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I don't think he's like really goes to like the meetings and stuff anymore, but um so anyways he took me and I haven't had a drink since. Wow. And uh so how long ago was that? Or what what year? How long have you been sober? Five years plus. Congratulations. Halloween is my sobriety date. Halloween September thirteenth. September thirteenth. Nine, 2013 yeah yes <laughs> yeah 1913 uh, and so um, so I, I I don't remember what really happened but um, I was living in Montevilla and I was working I think I was working out with a trainer I think I this guy Ryan Waldingford cool dude and I was working out with him and I think that like I was like when I started with him, I think I was still drinking and doing drugs, and then I got sober, and then wow, you were still working yeah, with him. and I stayed with him, and then something clicked, you know, when I was like, I think I just realized that like, all of a sudden I had a new lease on life, and that fitness made me feel good. Drugs and alcohol were making me feel the the illusion of good, but horrible. 
and I was looking for something to make you to feel to take the edge off the stress the the nervousness and I just so you like, had to put that into something else I just started to like I think anyone I think the people you know like if you're listening and you do exercise you know that feeling you get from a good workout if it's a run a swim a bike lifting weights boxing whatever it is when you put put it all on the table and then you're tired and then you put a little bit more on the table because you find that reserve because you always have that reserve and you get done and you're like feel like a sense of accomplishment a fatigue but an energized fatigue and also like I think anybody that is used to using drugs or alcohol is will, will find themselves looking for a release right like you have a stressful day of work or whatever. You have a glass of wine, even if the wine doesn't make you do, do the action of it is like a, a release, and that's what I get out of the fitness thing. And so I started like it started getting that feeling, and then I started like wanting to be healthy because I was so unhealthy, and I also I'm a fucking addict. So anything I do, I treat like an addict. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna get sober like a goddamn addict, and I'm gonna you know. And to this day, like, I mean, I have to actively practice not being neurotic about, like, exercising. Would you say that then addiction, in a sense, can be a yes a positive aspect of someone's personality, an addictive tendency? Because you could use it for, could be obviously a negative thing, but you could use it towards a positive thing. It's... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm de- like, you know, five years in, I'm finding a balance. Like, you know, like I texted you earlier in the week, like the workout that you decide to skip can sometimes be the best workout of the week. Absolutely, right. And yes. so like that's like, on, I guess we can talk about like running and stuff. But like this year on the journey of running, which if you do it poorly can injure you, um, is where like I was sh- I've shown growth. Versus like two years ago, three years ago when I got into running, I didn't have that mentality and I was training for a half marathon. And lo and behold, of course, I got hurt before and then had to, had got hurt training for a half marathon, had to do recovery to then run the half marathon, push through and get hurt. And that's not fun. You mentioned all these sports a second ago, all these different ways people can move their bodies and get, get a workout. Why or what about running to you has become so appealing? It is the most transcendent, I think, of the exercises. And I go to, like, it's where, like, it's the most meditative. It's also the one you talk about pushing through walls. It's the one that I have the most walls I have to push through when I'm doing it. Um, Why? I, I don't, Do you think that? Well, I'm not the type of person, I don't want to go out and run a really, really fast mile. I mean, that's maybe some people, that's not my, my body's not built for that. And I don't, that's not something I would find a lot of joy in. I like the feeling. Pure speed, you mean? Just yeah, I like the feeling of just like shedding, like running, especially like tra- finding trails has been like the way next level too because it's like, like making turn. Oh, you can turn a hike into a run and get like the best of both worlds. But like when you're out and like that's just where the I think a lot of it has to do with the breathing that's involved, the body connection. But I'm usually not thinking about all the things that stress me out when I'm out running. So it's as much a mental for sure release as oh, a physical God, yeah. release. Yeah. And that runner's high is real. He said the other day that's about the highest you get these days is when you're running on a trail. For sure. You run in Forest Park. That's our local yeah. treasure yeah. trove of trails. So tell me more about that though. Like what? What specifically about the trails is so exciting to you? Um, I love the, I mean, well, the feeling of dirt and rock under your feet versus sidewalk and asphalt. Um, the sounds, the smells, the scenery. And, you know, I talked about like kind of shedding all of the thought, right? Like when you have cars honking at you or bikes whizzing past you or whatever, in, you know, running the city is not a bad thing at all. It's fun and it's a whole different game that you play. But when you're on the trail, it seems like the miles melt a lot faster than when you're running in the city. And it just takes you away. 
as I said before, you are very inspiring to a lot of people, and one of the ways you're doing that, besides just living your life, is you have an Instagram account that is specific to your athletic goals, Fit Chef PDX. Yeah, I, th- I think that it's ath- it's just it's a healthy like lifestyle, you know. So um, your intent is to insp- fit. That's the, the you created it because you want to inspire others and show them that there's a yeah. A path. I think like I social media when done well. I think can be a wonderful thing for us, and the uh, I have a Instagram account that's like, you know, a Rucker Gabriel, and it's heavily chef person influenced one, <clears throat> and uh, I don't think that all those people, I, you know, I felt like not like I wanted to like bombard that whole thing with like stuff I'm doing at the gym, runs I'm doing. Uh, recovery quotes and um, so I kind of started that as just like because it is such a big part of my life that's not the cooking thing you know Mm. Um, and so I was like hey if this is what you're into you can check that out and if you just want pictures of foie gras and stuffed ducks then stick there that's fine you know Um, and uh and then now there's just, you know, I, I had this kind of realization about, you know, a lot of it with recovery and being public about recovery, but also, I mean, the fitness goes hand in hand. I mean, being a healthy chef is somewhat of a new concept because the older images, the hard drinking, smoke breaks, snorting coke, you know, working 16 hour day, which that still happens, but, you, you, you know, the image is like, it's not like a life of like, health and wellness and serenity so uh i had a kind of like come to jesus moment uh that 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 i could i could be a bad example and i was to a certain extent for a number of years there was plenty of young kids that came through my kitchen and saw me you know drinking whiskey passing them a whiskey bottle afterward smoking doing all that um i could be no example Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Or I could be a good example. And I have enough people that pay attention to what I do. Regardless, they don't have a choice. They just do. That I decided if I'm, you know, when I'm retired and I'm sitting on the porch with my wife. And I look back at life. Which one of those do I want to feel like I was? And be an example to your now three children. Yeah. So being, yeah. So be a good example. Right? If people pay attention to the stuff you do, I'm not sitting out here, you know, hey, look at me, do this, do, you know, but there's just, I'm in a position where people just watch what I do and pay attention. So if I'm doing stuff that, you know, let's break the mold too of this, this stereotype. And this is getting a ton of press right now, right? Just there's a recent article that came out in Portland Monthly. Yeah, the, idea, you, of, the idea of the sober chef is new. And uh, we did a dinner last year for Feast PDX for our, our local food festival. It was kind of a big deal, and I was lucky enough to kind of be the one that spearheaded the idea. Um, and it was it was called Zero Proof, and um, there's a lot of people in our business that are in recovery. And um, at the time that like the idea kind of was germinating, um, Andrew Zimmern. Bizarre Foods was filming at Le Pigeon. He has a lot of years of solid recovery. And him and I were chatting, and I just, I'd had this idea. Sorry. Say one more time. So, uh, him and I were chatting, and I'd had this seed of an idea. And I was like, well, I'll float this idea to him. You know, he's kind of a big deal, and I'll, I'll see, you know, because you, you know, it is called Alcoholics Anonymous, and then you, you, you know, put yourself out there. Let's see what he says about it. And so he kind of, he actually pulled me in the bathroom to like talk to me about like some AA stuff or whatever. And I was like, hey, I have this idea and uh, I wonder what you think of it. And he was just floored. He was like, this has never been done. This is huge. We got to do this. This is, you know. And so like, I kind of feel like I had like the blessing of this dude who was like a real big time dude. Reached out to people and everyone was just like 100% in. And, uh, that kind of got the ball rolling with, you know, hey, we're out here, we're doing this, and you don't have to, like, 
you can you can be like at the top of your game and be and tackle these yeah. challenges. This seems like a prime time to mention another new project of yours that just got going, Ben's Friends. Yeah, that's you great. To, Thank you. Yeah. Ben's Friends is um Ben's Friends is uh, I I I mean Gregory uh Gorday and I are not the founders of this. We are just leading. We were asked to bring this to Portland. It started in Charleston, and it's in about five or six cities in the south. It's in Minneapolis. And it is uh, not AA, but it is a re- they call it a bridge to recovery. It follows a similar AA trajectory. No God, no step work. And it's for people in the service industry uh, to get together that are in recovery or that are interested in finding recovery and we meet uh last tuesday the 5th of february mm-hmm. was our first meeting we actually had the founders from charleston fly out wow. to lead the meeting we're gonna be doing it every tuesday at 10 a.m at uh jacobson's salt every week. warehouse okay. inner southeast and it's just a place for there's a lot of people you know like i said you can be an example if you want to. So put myself out there, you know. That helps my own recovery, right? I'm accountable now. <laughs> like, you know, I've, it, it should I find myself being like, Ugh, which I hope I won't. But now I got some people that are like, kind of like paying attention to what mm-hmm. I'm doing, not just in the kitchen, but outside. Yeah, yeah. And so that helps that way. Um, and it's been a huge outpouring of interest. We had kind of kept it small for the first meeting, but I've got like so many people that are contacting me. There's a lot of us out there. And to have an area, a, a meeting where, you know, AA can be really scary for some people. I think AA is what, at the end of the day, what really works if you want to get sober. And, you know, there's getting sober, then there's working, being in recovery. You know, being in recovery is where, like, the, the flower really opens and you get, you know. The 12 steps are, fu- they fucking work. They're amazing. Yeah. And I, you know, rely on them daily. My marriage, parenthood, chefhood, driving, running, whatever it is. Like, that shit is valuable um but what ben's friends hopes to do is give people a chance if you're already doing that to get together and form community and if you're not and if you're nervous you can go to a meeting of a bunch of like-minded people that are all going through the same shit that you're going through not just with the drugs and alcohol but like the stresses of cooking waiting on tables making lattes you know it's a service industry right um washing dishes whatever it is but we all speak the same language we all talk the same talk and so that makes the the sharing and the community better and what i hope to get out of it is you know one of my favorite things about cooking and being a restaurateur in portland is i feel like here in this city we all really have each other's backs and there's an actual sense of community it's not like clawing to the top, backstabbing, fuck this guy, fuck that, you know, that place sucks. Like, I genuinely want, like, the people that have the French Bistro a few blocks away from Little Bird to succeed as much as I want Little Bird to succeed because what's good for my city is good for my restaurants in my city. And I think that, like, that's what I hope to get out of the Ben's Friends is that we can have a real let's sense of community and bring us a lot closer through this common struggle that we have. And then we go out, we talk about it, we talk about ways that we deal with it. If you're a chef or an owner, you talk about ways you deal with it. If you're an employee, you talk about ways that you, to do it. And then we go out and we make the experience in restaurants better and we spread that. Thank you for all that work. That's, that's no, really we'll see where it goes. Super cool. Yeah. So just a couple more questions. I do hope to have you on the show another time because there's so much to talk about. But just a couple more for today. So of all the, the things you've done, all these amazing accomplishments, multiple awards, some of the most prestigious awards you could possibly get, what are you most proud of? My family. Yeah? Yeah. Being able to, for sure, like, not, it's not even close. Like, being able to, uh, to find a balance. I love what I do as my job. But that is my job. There will be pans. Being a father. No, being being a rest oh, chef. Sorry, there will be kid. there will be pans. There will be food. There'll be onions, whatever, anywhere I go. But you only got one crack at being a good having a good family. And so the thing I'm you know 
finding a balance. You know, I don't work. Like, I have three restaurants. They're open seven days a week. Some of them from 8 in the morning until midnight. There's a good chance if you go into one of them, you won't see me preparing your meal. There's also a chance that you will, because I still do that. But um, I have found a work-life balance right now that I'm happy with. Four to five nights a week, I'm able to put my kids to bed and read them stories. I'm able to get up with them and take them to school. Um, I have the weekends off because my kids have the weekends off now. Um, and I think that, you know, I my new thing is like, what, what do I want to be when I'm sitting on that porch with my wife? How do I want to feel about things? And I do want to feel like I was a great chef, but I want to feel like I was a great dad and husband first, and I can be a great chef second. And then... I want to have some good running and fitness accomplishments after that. Sounds good. So lastly, this is something that I've asked everyone on the show, is because we highlight people who inspire and have you know huge impacts on, on other people who are listening and paying attention, is what advice would you give somebody who's trying to find find that way path in life and find their passion and or maybe somebody who's struggling with addiction or whatever it may be? Well, I think that the advice that I would give right now is to, to take it slow. Everyone wants things to happen so fast, right? Like the internet's here and you see like, everyone has like the social media life that they live and then they've got a real life, but we think that everyone else's social media life is their real life. <laughs> and you're like, but this person's doing this thing. And I think that you should take it slow and enjoy the process. This is coming from someone who did not take it slow and enjoy the process, but that was just where I was meant to be. But it's the advice that I want to share with like a lot of the young cooks that work for me. And I think it translates into a lot of things. It's like, don't be in too big of a hurry to get somewhere or else you won't enjoy the act of getting there. Thank you. Yeah. It's been wonderful to have you on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Of course. And all the things you're doing. And uh, we'll be excited to hear from you again. Sounds like a plan. Have a good day, Gabriel. Thank you. Sweet. Good deal. Nice. Thank you very much. <coughs> of course.